Good afternoon. Um, thank you for coming. I would like to tell you about light and warm superconductors, fact or fiction. BCS theory predicts that light elements should make high temperature superconductors. And uh, most people certainly here believe that's uh, true. Hydrates under high pressure are expected to be high TC superconductors. And during the last seven years, 15 different such hydrides uh, or more by now have been claimed to be superconductors with TCs exceeding those of the high TC cuprates. And many other light elements compounds have been predicted to be high TC superconductors by analogy with magnesium diboride. I will argue here that none of these claims and predictions have been independently and reproducibly verified and in fact, to date, the experimental evidence that light elements favor high temperature superconductivity is zero. If what I'm arguing is true, it indicates that there is a fundamental flaw in the BCS assumption that electron phonon interaction causes superconductivity. Uh, this is a recent uh, perspective I wrote in Applied Physics Letters about this. So let's with CSH, um, that um, we were told uh, two years ago that it was a room temperature superconductor. And uh, we were shown a curse for resistance and AC susceptibility that showed very compelling uh, evidence for superconductivity. Now, uh, we have done work uh, in collaboration with Frank Marsiglio where we pointed out that the resistance curves were very, very sharp, incompatible with what you expect. For a superconductor, and uh, I done work with Dirk van der Marel to show that there was an incompatibility uh, with the raw data that were posted in archive by the authors of the Nature Paper and the published data in the Nature Paper. In particular, if we look at this tail of the curve for 160 GPA, what we found is that the data has this um, peculiar stepped shape uh, like this, in that they can be written exactly as a function Q of t, which is a, what we call the quantized component, and P of t, that we call the unwrapped curve, which is a smooth curve. And um, we have analytic formulas for these two functions from which we get what is reported to be the data. On the other hand, the authors in the archive paper published the raw data, and the background can be inferred by subtraction. And as you see, they look very different from what we have here. But the data are, of course, the same. So the, there's two versions of reality here. The same data can be expressed either as the difference between these two noisy functions or as the sum of this step function and this smooth curve, both of which have analytic expressions. And so the left side was calculated in a computer, the right side was measured in a laboratory. And so uh, I don't believe that there's alternative facts. So I think one of these is fact and one is not. We were told today in five different talks about other things that were measured in DS lab. And so my question is if we can calculate in a computer these measurements that were done in DS lab, I don't know whether or not we can calculate those measurements in a computer. And let me point out, it's not just the tail of that curve. The entire curve uh, for 160 GPA is represented in these two alternative ways. And in particular, what's said to be the evidence, the transition to superconductivity is expressed analytically. And we show this in the work that is published in these three papers. And so in conclusion, what can be calculated in a computer, we think does not reflect the properties of the real physical system CSH. All right, so this is for CSH. Now, what about all the other hydrates? So I don't have a lot of time. I have here a lot of experimental data that I would like to go over with you. The one on the top, uh, this is in collaboration with Frank Marsiglio. The top one on the left is from Eremet's work on magnetization of sulfur hydride where he publishes two very different curves with different magnitudes for zero field cooling. And there is no signature at all for field cooling. In more recent work, they show us magnetization versus magnetic field that show behavior that's uh, very different from what is expected both for a type two superconductor and for a hard superconductor described by the Bean model. 
More recently, we saw trapped moment measurements uh, from the Minkoff et al. work, but if you look and compare the measurements, they are kind of incompatible because the field penetrates and gets trapped here, uh, uh, and the same field here is excluded from the sample. So when you, and also the behavior of the zero field cooled um, data is, uh, as we showed, not physical. The hysteresis loop shows that the magnetization curve does not join the hysteresis loop, which is anomalous. The data that were published a few years ago on nuclear resonance scattering, again, are incompatible with the trap flux because you cannot both exclude the same field and trap the same field in the same kind of measurement. So uh, we have done a lot of analysis on also other experiments by Wang et al., by Timos et al. Uh, basically, the message of this is that the experiments are inconsistent with each other and they have not been independently reproduced. And in particular, I would like to point out the London penetration depth that you extract out of these measurements is totally anomalous, is very short compared to that of standard superconductors that show that as the TC increases, the London penetration depth gets bigger and you don't have any other example like this uh, of high TC with very short penetration depth. All right. Many other light elements have been predicted to be high TC superconductors in analogy with MGB2. Here I have a list of 40 different predictions uh, by theory over the last several years. Uh, this is examples of some of these calculations by experts in these calculations. None of these has been found so far to be superconducting. And uh, on the other hand, we are told that theory directs the discovery of high temperature superconductivity in clathrides. Each of these experimental studies that discovered all these hydride superconductors were guided by theoretical predictions. So my question is, why is it so much easier to predict high-rest superconductors at high pressure than to predict light element superconductors at high pressure where none have been found? And I think the answer is confirmation bias. So we don't know really whether these hydrates are superconductors. They are predicted to be superconductors. And so uh, people select information that supports their view. They ignore contrary information and uh, they interpret ambiguous evidence as supporting what they expect. And this is strongest for desired outcomes and uh, especially for deeply entrenched beliefs. And as we know, BCS theory is a deeply entrenched belief. So uh, BCS theory, they says that TC is proportional to M to one half. Let's look at the elements. So what do we see in the elements? Low mass should give highest TC, high mass should give lowest TC. And what do we see? The highest TC elements are the seven elements here. They don't seem to be particularly low mass. The lowest TC elements are the ones in uh, brown here. They are also not particularly high mass. There's no connection between the expectation of BCS theory and reality. If we plot the graphs this way, high TC is expected for small atomic number, but all of these materials are very low or zero TC. Low TC is expected for high atomic numbers, but look at these materials that have high TC. Now, why could that be? And then the highest ones are kind of in the middle. TC, we are told, is proportional to this formula, and so you would have to assume that for some reason, mu star, the Coulomb pseudo-potential, decreases with M. Well, nobody has shown that, or that perhaps lambda increases with M. Nobody has shown that either. So uh, if uh, the lambda and mu are kind of distributed randomly in the periodic table, you should see some correlation between the mass and the TC, and you see none. If you look at the isotope effect, there is a lot of examples of materials that do not show anything related to M2 to the minus one half. The, in the elements, you have zero isotope effect elements. Uh, in lithium under pressure, you have alphas that are bigger than one and small and negative. In strontium titanate, it's uh, totally contrary to what's expected. In palladium hydride, it's also negative. In the cuprates and pnictides that are supposed to be unconventional, you also see isotope effects. So here's a contrast of what BCS says. The elements should look like, as I show you. Here is a, another quantity, the whole coefficient. And what this shows is that superconductivity appears when Elements have positive hole coefficient, and when they have negative hole coefficient, most of them are not superconductors. So I wrote this paper 
recently where I contrast what the theory of whole superconductivity predicts versus what the conventional theory predicts uh, and in connection with the hydrides. So this is a theory we've been working on for many, many years. And basically, it's orthogonal to basically electron phonon theory. The phonons have nothing to do with superconductivity. And anyway, we have written all the papers that I cannot go over. Basically, the theory says that you require nearly full bands, anti-bonding states. One thing I want to point out is that uh, Matthias pointed out long ago that crystallography and stability seem to be a necessary condition for high TC superconductivity, which is what you get when you have anti-bonding states and unstable lattices. So pressure can stabilize unstable lattices and create favorable conditions. That's why pressure, high pressure is a promising route for high temperature superconductors. But the phonons and the ionic mass, I think, are irrelevant. You need to look for positive hole coefficients. Let me summarize. Current consensus is that hydrides and strong electron for a uh, strong electron for interaction and high form frequency give high TC. Let's assume it turns out that all the hydrides that we have been considering are not high temperature superconductors and that the resistance drops for reasons unrelated to superconductivity. That would mean that strong electron for interaction, high form of frequency do not give high TC. We don't know that yet, but uh, let's say that happens then. That would mean that all the theoretical predictions based on the conventional theory for high TC in high rates were wrong. And then it wouldn't be any reason to believe that weaker electron phonon interaction and lower phonon frequency will give any TC, right? And so if that was the case, we would have to conclude that there are no electron phonon superconductors and look for other mechanisms. And I'm suggesting we should look for systems that have whole carriers and negatively charged anions in close proximity in high pressure experiments. And that's how we are going to find room temperature superconductors. Thank you for your attention. Are there any questions? Okay, but I haven't seen the evidence confirming. Uh, Can you repeat the question for everybody? Else? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, I was asked two questions. One is on the trap flux experiments, and one is apparently there is some recent um, recent uh, experiments that show superconductivity in some magnesium diboride similar systems that were predicted by theory. I am not aware of those. I will look at those if you give me information. On the on the trap flux experiments, I would like to point out that uh, as I said we have done an analysis that I don't have here, but uh, let me just point out one thing. In the trap flux experiments, for example, uh, this is a zero field curve experiment. It says that you cool in zero field, then you apply a field, and as a function of the applied field, the, and then you remove it, and the trap flux is linear. That's impossible. If you, Oh, I just found out about those experiments today, so I cannot really, but it's interesting, but I would like to point out that apparently in those experiments, they apply a very small field and they see a signal. Now, all these magnetization measurements say that the lower critical field is something like a hundred millitesla, which is like a thousand gauss. And if you see in this magnetization measurement, the the field of up to a thousand gauss is excluded from the sample. So how can it be that they apply like a hundred gauss or 50 gauss in the first talk that we heard and they saw a signal? That doesn't make sense to me. And, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Oh, yes. Do, do you have any experimental evidence for your theory of superconductivity? Yes, there is experimental evidence for my theory of superconductivity. We predicted, just to give you a couple of examples, uh, the very beginning that tunneling uh, should be asymmetric because uh, of electron hole symmetry breaking is fundamental to the theory. So when you do tunneling into a superconductor, 
you should get a bigger signal for a negative if by a sample that was in 1989 we predicted it took many years and then finally around 1996 oyster fisher in geneva showed very clear evidence that that is the case so that was a, a very very definite prediction of the theory another one was optical experiments we predicted that there would be a change in optical absorption at high frequencies which is not expected from bcs theory and because that would signal a change in kinetic energy of the carriers and that was uh, found experimentally uh, many years after we predicted it but i cannot say that i have proven it beyond doubt of course not and that will require other experiments so you think that uh, you have unconfirmed bias i'm sorry do you think that uh, you have unconfirmed bias? that's a very good question uh, do i have confirmation bias could be uh, <laughs>